Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your employee benefits broadcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star then zero on your touchstone telephone. As a reminder, this conference may be recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to our host, Ms. Kathy Ozawa. Ma'am, you may begin. Hi. Thank you, for everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping issues. If you need any technical assistance during the call, please dial uh, the number here, 866-493-2825. And if you have problems hearing us, then just dial star zero. Uh, we do have a few minutes at the end of the presentation for you to ask questions, and you can do so by using the Q&A pull-down menu at the top of your screen and type out your questions, and we'll try to get to them either during the presentation or we'll contact you afterwards. If you'd like to maximize your PowerPoint to the full screen, just hit F5. And at the end, you can certainly print a copy of this presentation by just printing on the, clicking on the printer icon in the lower right-hand corner, then convert to the presentation to a PDF, and then just print as usual. So we have a pretty good lineup today. It's really exciting. First of all, we're going to hear from Casey Fleming, who is an associate in our Milwaukee office, and she's going to be talking about an interesting case about Young versus UPS and the use of um, sort of statute of limitations within plan documents. Next, we're going to be hearing from Mike Wolver, a partner in our Chicago office, who's going to be talking about the recently disclosed sort of delay in some of the effective dates for some of the health care reform requirements. Then we're going to be hearing from Isaac Morris, who's an associate in our Milwaukee office, and he's going to be talking about Tibble versus Edison, which is a 401k excess uh, fee case, which is rather interesting. And then in the spotlight, we'll be featuring Lee Riley, who's a partner in our Milwaukee office, to talk about the new IRS guidance on how to report the cost of health care coverage on the Form W-2. So with that... I'd like to be able to turn it over to Casey, who's going to be talking about Young versus UPS. Thanks, Kathy. As Kathy mentioned in her introduction, I'll be presenting on Young v. UPS Employees' Short-Term Disability Plan, a March 22nd opinion out of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which reminded us of the importance of including a contractual limitations period in plan documents. Before we discuss the specifics of the case, I wanted to start by giving you some background on the statute of limitations rules as they relate to ERISA plans. As you may or may not know, ERISA does not contain a statute of limitations for private actions to recover benefits. Accordingly, in deciding whether a participant's action for benefits is timely, courts will look at the most closely analogous statute of limitations under the applicable state law. This generally means that the court will look to the breach of contract statute of limitations. Most states, including Wisconsin and Utah, have six-year statutes of limitations. But some states have longer limitations periods. For example, Illinois has a 10-year statute of limitations. To avoid these long limitations periods, plan sponsors are permitted to include a reasonable contractual limitations period in their plan documents. For example, the SPD at issue in Young v. UPS provided that any legal action to receive benefits under the plan must be filed by the earlier of six months from the date a determination is made under the plan or should have been made in accordance with the plan's claims review procedures or three years from the date the service or treatment was provided or the date the claim arose, whichever is earlier. The provision also informed participants that their failure to file a lawsuit within this time frame would result in the loss of the participant's right to file. Keeping that background in mind, let's move on to the discussion of the case. Looking at the facts of the case, we learn that the plaintiff, Ms. Young, was a former UPS employee who began to receive short-term disability benefits under the UPS Short-Term Disability Plan in 2007. Ms. Young's disability benefits terminated on March 11, 2008, as a result of her failure to provide medical information supporting her disability beyond that date. In response, Ms. Young appealed that decision to terminate her benefits pursuant to the plan's appeals procedures and received a final denial of her appeal on October 17, 2008. 
In response, Ms. Young filed a suit for benefits almost a year later on September 8, 2009, which, if you recall, would have been sufficient under the Utah statute of limitations period of six years, but did exceed the time allowed under the UPS plan. Because of the nature of this case and the facts involved, the content of the plan documents and participant communications are especially important. As you may recall, the SPD contained a contractual limitations provision. Under this provision, Ms. Young had six months from the final determination date to file a suit in court. This means that with a final determination date of October 17, 2008, April 17, 2009 would have been her last day to file. The UPS plan document did not contain the same language. However, the plan did expressly incorporate the terms of the SPD, including the limitations on legal action provision, and provided that in the case of a conflict between the plan document and the SPD, that the SPD would govern. Lastly, the final denial letter informed Ms. Young that she may have a right to sue under ERISA, but it did not reference the six-month limitation on legal action period. With all of this in mind, let's look at Ms. Young's allegations. First, she alleged that the limitation on legal action provision was an unauthorized amendment to the UPS plan. Second, she alleged that the provision was ambiguous and unenforceable. And finally, she alleged that UPS breached its promise contained in the SPD to inform her of the six-month time limit for filing suit. Ms. Young first filed her case in the Utah District Court, which ruled in favor of UPS, finding that the six-month limitation in the SPD was reasonable and enforceable. Ms. Young then appealed this decision. So now let's look at how the Court of Appeals handled each of Ms. Young's three allegations. Allegation number one, that the limitation on legal action provision was an unauthorized amendment to the UPS plan because it was only included in the SPD and not in the plan document. In looking at this argument, the Court of Appeals concluded that it was not an unauthorized amendment because the plan expressly incorporated the terms of the SPD and stated that in the event of a conflict, the terms of the SPD would govern. It's important to note here that the Court of Appeals opinion highlighted that Ms. Young did not contend that the amendment failed to comply with the formal plan amendment procedures just that it was an unauthorized amendment because it was only included in the SPD. Without more information, we cannot be sure why the court added this language to its opinion, but it is worth noting because we suspect the court was suggesting that Ms. Young may have made a mistake by omitting the argument. Allegation number two, that the limitation on legal action provision itself was ambiguous. The court considered this argument and concluded that the format and language of the provision were clear enough to communicate to Ms. Young that she had to file her action by April 17, 2009, or waive her right to file suit in court. Allegation number three, that UPS breached its promise in the SPD to inform her of the time limit for filing suit because the denial letter did not reference the plan's six-month limitations period. With respect to this argument, the court concluded that consistent with, with ERISA requirements, the SPD only stated that notice must be provided regarding the time limits applicable to the internal appeal process. For example, how long Ms. Young had to file her second appeal after receiving her first level appeal denial. It did not require the notice to communicate the six-month contractual limitations period. Accordingly, the Tenth Circuit agreed with the district court's decision and dismissed Ms. Young's complaint. Okay, so let's talk about what you should do. First, if your plan documents do not already include a contractual limitations period, consider adding one now. Of course, this will be subject to certain collective bargaining restraints. As you might recall, the UPS SPD included a six-month limitation period. However, many of our clients include a one-year limitation period. Besides the fact that the internal limitations period will provide some peace of mind because it will limit the time period during which you can expect a lawsuit from participants, it is also important from an administrative perspective because many record retention policies do not contemplate retention of 10-year-old documents. Second, 
confirm that your plan document and SPD are consistent. Unlike the UPS documents, we recommend adding the limitations period to both the plan document and SPD. And even if you follow our advice and add the same language in both documents, it is a good idea to also address which document, the formal plan document or the SPD, would govern in the case of a conflict. This is important not only because it will apply to the limitations period provision, but because it will also apply to any other plan provisions which may be in conflict. The plan document in Young v. UPS stated that the SPD would govern in case of a conflict. However, you might want to note that many of our clients prefer to have the plan document control. Third, always follow the established plan and SPD amendment procedures. This is important considering the court's remark regarding Ms. Young's failure to address this point in her complaint. Had she questioned whether UPS had followed its formal amendment procedures, the case may have had a different outcome. Finally, even though the court in Young v. UPS did not require it, communicate the limitations period in your final appeal denial notices. Thank you very much. If you have any questions about this case or any of the other information I provided, we will try to get to them at the end of the broadcast. Until then, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Casey. Um, if you only read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, uh, you would think that health care reform doesn't really kick in until 2014 and later. Um, but as many of you know, uh, much of the changes required by health care reform uh, became effective as early as last November. What I'm going to talk about today is a recent notice that extended a non-enforcement uh, period announced by the IRS Department of Labor and Health and Human Services for some of the new requirements, particularly the new requirements having to do with how you operate your internal claims and appeals procedures. Um, Health care reform made two fundamental changes in this area, two fundamental changes, the first being to expand the coverage of the ERISA requirements to non-ERISA plans and individual insurance policies, basically making them subject to the same rules that are set forth in the Department of Labor's regulations um, under Section 503, and also creating an expanded, statutorily created uh, series of standards for determining whether or not you had a reasonable claims procedure and whether or not your plan um, allows full and fair review of claims denial. And it's really these additional requirements that are technically, in, uh, should be in effect now, uh, that are the focus of this new guidance that we received. What healthcare reform does in the area of internal claims and appeals is change a number of existing rules. First of all, it takes the period of time that the Department of Labor regulations allow for uh, making an initial benefit determination on an urgent claim and reduces it from 72 hours to 24, a period of time which many, many uh, insurance companies and other service providers to plans are having a hard time dealing with administratively. Uh, it also creates a rule that if in the course of your evaluation of a claim you get new information or think of a new way of thinking about the claim, it creates an affirmative obligation to reach out to the participant and tell them that you're doing that uh, and let them comment on what you're doing all within your normal 15 or 30 day claims period. Third, it requires that like SPDs, uh, your benefit notices have to be culturally and linguistically appropriate and therefore if you have a high percentage of of uh, non-English speakers, your benefits are going to have to be uh, translated and, and your notice is provided in, in the appropriate language. Uh, fourth, and this is another one that people are having a hard time with, uh, it significantly expands uh, the nature and scope of information that must be included in the EOB, uh, including a specific date of service, provider name, other information uh, intended so that you can figure out what the specific claim is that's being uh, referenced by the notice, um, treatment codes and diagnosis codes, uh, and, and actual descriptions of why a benefit's being denied rather than a statement saying, you know, if you want our procedures or whatever else we relied on, you can ask for it. Uh, so all of a sudden now your EOBs have to be sort of self-contained 
um, and, and, and will be much longer. Um, the statute also creates a conflict of interest process whereby you have to have certain anti-conflict of interest procedures in, in place for your procedure to be considered reasonable uh, and creates a, a strict liability, strict adherence standard so that if, in effect, you don't strictly adhere to these new procedures and rules, um, it gives the participant the right to file suit without exhausting uh, their administrative remedies and, and also can give the uh, a judge the ability to look at whatever decisions had been previously made um, at the internal stage uh, subject to um, a de novo review. And finally, the statute creates a new interim review stage in which a participant can ask to have their claim reviewed by, um, after the internal process, by an independent review organization. Um, the, the government agencies in charge of this, HHS and DOL and IRS, realized that some of these changes were fundamental, that it was going to be complicated, and so they quickly jumped on uh, the process of getting guidance out. Um, uh, the first interim regulations on these new rules came out in July. Um, in August, they came out with interim uh, regulations and a safe harbor uh, for dealing with the new requirement that you provide external review processes. Um, and then also in July, really recognizing that this was going to require significant changes in people's computer systems and processes and maybe hiring new people and training. Um, there was an announcement of a what was called an enforcement grace period, uh, so that in effect uh, some of the rules with the government agencies would not effect, uh, aggressively enforce those rules. That included the shortening of the period for urgent claims decisions to 24 hours, the requirement to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate notices. Uh, the requirements for expanding the content of the EOB and, and the requirement that you strictly comply and the adverse consequences that follow from that. And, and what they did is they said we weren't going to enforce these rules uh, aggressively until uh, July of this year. Now, the non-enforcement technically was limited to uh, self-funded non-federal government health plans. Uh, and only if they were working in good faith to implement the new rules. And therefore, you had to be making an effort to comply. You just weren't quite getting everything done that needed to be. Part of the reason for this was um, that uh, the federal government agencies don't really control the insurance industry, uh, but they also said they encouraged the state insurance departments to provide similar non-enforcement uh, authority to uh, state insurance companies. And, and for the most part, that's exactly what's happened. The new release came out in March, and, and it differs in a, in a couple of ways. One, it has some staggered effective dates. Um, and more importantly, it differs in terms of why it's coming out. Uh, again, the first notice was very clear that they were coming out with this non-enforcement period because it wasn't reasonable to accept pe that people would be up to speed, that there was a lot to be done in terms of reprogramming computers and training people to, to meet these new standards, and therefore they recognized that people needed more time. The basis for the, the new release is that um, they are now done a lot of work, and there's a new set of interim final regulations coming out, and they basically said, uh, you might as well see what those are, and we'll give you a little bit of time to review those and understand those and, and modify what you've already done so you comply with the new rules, um, and, and we need that's going to take a little more time. And so they basically extended it uh, until – the next plan year for that reason. One of the things that I found very interesting in that uh, notice, however, was a footnote that basically said that the non-enforcement period does not address the issue of what rights a private party has in private litigation. In other words, they weren't saying that a participant couldn't sue you for not complying. It's just that they wouldn't enforce it in terms of the agency wouldn't enforce it, but they weren't saying it took away the rights of the participant. The release and the extension of the non-enforcement period really goes now until the first plan year beginning after January 1, 2012. So for most calendar year health plans, uh, next January, which you have to get up to speed. 
On the other hand, you do have to get in place this expanded notice, the new EOBs with new information, effective for the first plan year after July 1. So if you've got a fiscal year plan, you may be required to get up to speed on that quicker, with one exception, and that is that they're giving you until January 1 or the plan years after that in order to incorporate the additional discussion of specific diagnosis codes, treatment codes, and, and what those codes mean. What you really need to do if you haven't gotten your EOB fixed, this is the new information that's got to be included for EOBs issued after June 30th. One, information sufficient to specifically identify the claim, the treatment, the doctor, the date, much more information that was in, in the simple forms that have been used in the past. Second, a detailed description of the reason for the adverse benefit determination. Third, uh, a description of the available appeals and external review processes. And again, the Department of Labor has published some guidance on this. And what I see a lot of people doing is adding a piece of paper at the back of the EOB that includes the various appeals rights and external review rights. And, and finally, uh, uh, healthcare reform also created a concept of state level consumer advocates that you can contact, and the states have been setting that up. Uh, and so, and you need to give that information in your EOBs again after June 30th. One clarification, we mentioned earlier this whole new process of external review. Um, the clarification is that none of this extension, this safe harbor, uh, not enforcement that have been created for the internal process applies to the obligations for external review. There is a current, current obligation to provide external review. There's a safe harbor published back in uh, August that applies. Um, but all of the date pushing that we've been talking about doesn't apply uh, to these to this new requirement that, uh, again, you should have in place at this point. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Isaac, who's going to talk about another litigation case. Okay. Thank you, Mike. I would just uh, uh, like to start out with some housekeeping of my own. I would just uh, ask uh, the other presenters on the line. I may have lost my Internet connection, so if I could have someone control my slides for me, that would be great. I can do that. I do. Great. Me. Thank you. So for the next few minutes, I will be discussing the Tibble v. Edison decision. Uh, this is a district court decision that comes out of the Northern District of California. And as this first slide shows, this is a case involving claims of excessive fees. I just want to start out with some general background about this decision. This really is a hotbed of a litigation area. You have a lot of allegations of fiduciary breaches. Uh, notably, you have both Congress and the Department of Labor paying increased attention on fees paid by plans. In fact, earlier this year in our February webinar conference, one of my Chicago colleagues, Galen Mason, discussed the new regulations involving service provider fee disclosures. And in addition, you also have a lot of litigation, about 30 class actions uh, alleging excessive fees in about the past five and a half years. So all of that being said, why am I entitling this as only a minor victory? Well, there are multiple reasons, and I just want to mention two. Uh, the first is that the, the planned fiduciaries here were successful in getting the judge to reject most of the claims of the participants. That was good news, or at least semi-good news for the uh, fiduciaries. And, um, and the, the other item that I want to, to, to point out is that there, it, this case is really quite fact-specific. Uh, there's a lot of nuances involved in this decision, uh, several of which we'll discuss in the coming slides. But one fact that I think that is really worth mentioning is the number of committees and subcommittees that were involved in watching over and taking care of the plan assets here. There was a huge amount of, of delegation and sharing of responsibility involving the plan assets. And I think, at least in one respect, that may have hurt the fiduciaries and I'll refer back to this later again. So moving on to the fiduciary duties, as with many other claims uh, against plant fiduciaries, this, uh, this case involved uh, alleged breaches of both the duty of loyalty and the duty of prudence. 
And as you are probably well aware, the duty of loyalty basically requires a fiduciary to discharge her duties with respect to the plan. Uh, that's solely it with respect to the interests of the, the participants and the beneficiaries. The duty of prudence, which I kind of consider to be a, a sister duty, uh, requires a fiduciary to act with the care, the skill, the diligence that a prudent person acting in a like capacity and, and familiar with such matters would act in such a situation. So moving on to some pertinent facts about the decision, there's a lot of money involved here, as is often the case with these uh, with these claims, about two to three billion dollars in assets. And originally, the plan only offered six investment alternatives, not a lot. But then we have some union negotiations where the number of alternatives balloons to 50, so a significant increase. And also about this time, we have revenue sharing arrangements being added, and this is quite important because previous to this, uh, previous to the arrangements being added, all costs were paid by the plan sponsor. And after the arrangements are added, the sponsor is essentially able to offset some of the costs that it's paying um, because the, the revenue sharing arrangements are, are, are put into place. So moving on, as I referenced earlier, only two claims make it to trial. So, which is pretty good news for the uh, planned fiduciaries, um, although I'm sure they, they rather would have had nothing make it to trial. But the two claims that do make it to trial involve the money market fund and the class shares. And with respect to the money market fund, here the participants are alleging uh, a breach of duty of prudence because the, uh, they allege that the participants selected and retained a fund uh, excuse me, that the fiduciary selected and retained a fund that charged excessive fees. With respect to the class shares, the participants uh, alleged a breach of duty of loyalty and a breach of duty of prudence. Uh, with respect to loyalty, the participants were claiming that the fiduciaries were improperly motivated by revenue sharing, which uh, allegedly increased the fees that were paid by the plan participants and lowered the costs for the plan sponsor. With respect to the duty of prudence claim, it's important to separate uh, that claim into the retail shares that were selected before August of 2001 and those that were selected after that time. And that is because that with respect to the pre-2001 shares, the court said prior to trial that the participants were prohibited from, from arguing that the initial selection was a breach. And that was essentially because that the participants had waited too long to bring that claim. And so the participants, uh, showing, some, showing some moxie and probably having some clever lawyers, said, okay, well, if we can't argue that the initial selection was a breach, we're going to argue that subsequent changes to those, to those shares, to those funds, should have caused you, planned fiduciaries, to look back and reconsider your decision. And those changes essentially consisted of some name changes to the shares as well as some small changes in investment strategy. Uh, with respect to the shares that were selected after August of 2001, the participants were allowed to proceed on their uh, uh, claim of the breach of duty of prudence with, uh, with respect to the initial selection. So let's move on and see what happens here. Again, as I've been saying um, for the past few minutes, the fiduciaries did have some success, and that continues with respect to some of these claims at, at the actual trial. With respect to the money market fund and the duty of uh, prudence, the judge just rejected that uh, 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 quite easily, saying that fiduciaries have no duty to select the cheapest option available and that fees are one of the many considerations that need to be uh, taken into account. And in doing so, didn't really say anything new, really followed a uh, past precedent of what uh, other decisions have held. But even when you look at the specific facts here, it was also good for the plant fiduciaries. The, the fees with respect to the money market fund were within a reasonable range. They're not the most, uh, they're not the cheapest, uh, but they're far from being the most expensive. And the fiduciaries had also really done their homework 
with respect to the money market fund. They had done a lot of researching, had done the necessary comparisons, monitored the fund's performance, and had uh, conducted periodic reviews. And over the course of those reviews, the fees for the money market fund uh, were reduced several times. So good news for the fiduciaries in that case. With respect to the class shares and the duty of loyalty, this was another victory for the fiduciaries. The, the court rejected the, the conflict of interest claim, saying that, that just, having the, just having the existence of a conflict of interest is not enough to establish a breach of the duty of loyalty, that, that uh, par the participants needed to show a motivating decision, a motivating desire by the fiduciaries to serve the interests of others or, or the, uh, the interests of themselves over the planned fiduciaries. And here the evidence just showed the contrary, that in fact several times the fiduciaries had acted to, uh, to lower those revenue sharing arrangements and, and accordingly uh, received, the, the plan sponsor received uh, less offset of the fees that it was paying as a result. But here's where, moving on to the, to the class shares and the duty of prudence, here is where the uh, fiduciaries made some mistakes. And for those shares that were selected post-August of 2001, um, the, the court found in favor of the, the plan participants, uh, basically saying that the fiduciaries had never considered or evaluated the institutional share classes. And in fact, had they even done so, had they looked at it even just a little bit, they clearly would have uh, chosen the institutional share classes because those um, – those classes had lower fees, and there was no other difference aside from the fees between the retail shares and the institutional shares. And here is where I wonder whether or not the, the number of committees and the subcommittees and all the sharing and delegation of power may have hurt the, uh, the fiduciaries and, and, uh, and the plan sponsor. Um, you just have to to question with all of the successes the fiduciaries were, were having and with all of the homework they were doing, all of the diligence they were conducting, how did this issue get dropped? And so my mind kept coming back to the fact that maybe there, was, there were too many people involved here. Maybe there were too many uh, spoons in the pot. And it's possible that, uh, that they did everything like that on purpose but I just wonder if the organization was set up and, um, and it caused problems and, and hurt them in the end. Uh, on kind of a, uh, a pat yourself on the back, smaller, small victory, they did, they did succeed on those uh, pre-2001 uh, share classes. The, the court found that the, those changes, the name change and the small change in investment strategy, just wasn't enough to revisit that decision. I want to talk just quickly about some unsuccessful defenses that the fiduciaries tried to use here, because it's not like they didn't try, or at least didn't try after the fact. Um, one of the uh, defenses they tried to bring was this mandatory investment minimum defense, saying that, you know, we couldn't have chosen the institutional shares, and we had to choose the retail shares, because the institutional shares had mandatory investment minimums and we didn't have uh, the, the amount of assets that we had just weren't enough to meet those minimums. The problem with this is that there was a lot of testimony at trial from various experts that it's fairly common uh, to, to, to seek and to receive waivers of these fees, uh, almost as a matter of course, and making things even worse for the fiduciaries was the fact that they, there was no evidence they had even tried uh, to investigate that option, that they had tried to receive the waiver. So, and uh, as you can imagine, that really hurt them. They also tried to rely on the independent advice of, the, of their third-party record keeper, who was Hewitt Financial Services, saying, you know, we discussed this issue with them, and they gave it the stamp of approval. Well, the problem here is that the courts looked at the evidence and said, well, that's all fine and good, but there's no, there's no indication that Hewitt ever considered the, the differences between the retail share classes and the institutional share classes. So essentially saying you can't punt to another party 
when that party is not doing its job as well. And this is a good segue to move into uh, my final uh, slide, the, the action items and the takeaways. Uh, first, I want to emphasize and strongly that please do not read this decision uh, as being an outright pro prohibition against retail share classes. I know there has been some indication about that in the, uh, the newsletters out there, but I don't read that as being the case. I would certainly be careful with retail share classes, but even in the actual decision itself, the court implied that, that retail funds could be a better choice in some instances uh, due to items such as participant familiarity and the availability, the availability of more public information. I also think that um, sometimes retail share classes can have a longer uh, performance history uh, and, and sometimes uh, institutional uh, classes may have no performance history. And so all of those are items that should be taken into account. Um, it, it now may be a good time to revisit some of your existing retail offerings if you do have them uh, as part of your plan. You know, if, if you made the decision within the past one or two years or some short time period, excuse me, and you can look back and see why you did what you did, you might be okay and, and uh, uh, it might be all right to put a, a tickler on your calendar for the future to go back and reinvestigate at some, at some point down the road. But if it's been six or seven years and you look back and you say, I'm not really sure why we did this, now would be a good time to, to reinvestigate that decision and to see if uh, possibly institutional share classes would be a better choice. And if you're thinking about offering them now, same, uh, same uh, thinking process there. Uh, the, if, if, if you are choosing the retail share classes because of uh, uh, minimum uh, funding requirements, please look into asking for waivers. A uh, smaller point, but one that I still think deserves mentioning, is who should bear the administrative costs, the plan or the plan sponsor? And while I cannot give you a, uh, a, bright, a bright, easy answer um, uh, for any of these uh, uh, points, it, it all goes back to you need to conduct that necessary uh, diligence and, and, and consideration. Certainly in this case, however, the, the fact that the, uh, the plan sponsor was paying for the costs and also that there were revenue sharing arrangements in place did allow the participants to at least uh, allege that, uh, that breach of duty of loyalty claim. And finally, I just want to end with uh, you should not only be uh, conducting yourself in a prudent and, and loyal manner, but please document uh, those actions. I find it hard enough to remember what happened two weeks ago. If someone were to ask me what happened six or seven years ago, I would be in a lot of trouble. And I imagine that would be the case here. You have enough to worry about with having uh, um, to put one more thing on your plate. So please uh, document. You don't need a, a lengthy, uh, a lengthy uh, book written on, on what you did. But, you know, a few, a few sentences, a few paragraphs, enough to refresh your memory. Uh, would be helpful and, and will give you uh, the best chance to be able to uh, sleep at night. And so with all that being said, I'm going to turn the time over to Lee. Lee? Thank you, Isaac. So we are now going to switch from the lofty heights of fiduciary duty down to the incredibly mundane issue of W-2 reporting. So just recently, the IRS issued guidance on how do you report the cost of health care coverage on employees' Form W-2s. So this requirement is another little goodie that came out of last year's health care reform law, along with dozens of other new requirements. And um, when people were sending out their newsletters, including Foley, and we, we had here's the list of all the changes made by PAPACA, and one of the things we mentioned in there was that, you know, at some point you're going to have to report the value of employees' health coverage on their W-2. I probably got about a dozen emails saying, ah, does that mean that health coverage is now going to be taxable? And the answer to that is no. So this is not a change in the taxation of health benefits. This is simply an informational reporting requirement that is now being added uh, to the W-2 that is the employer's responsibility. 
And the purported reason for adding this requirement is so that your employees can understand the value of the health care coverage that the employer is providing to them, and that is going to help make the employee a better consumer. So maybe the intent is, um, you know, at some point, assuming this law survives the constitutional challenges, in 2014, there's going to be these state exchanges where individuals can go and buy insurance on the exchange. So maybe the intent of this reporting requirement is so that the employees can look at the value of the coverage their employer is providing them, look at how much my coverage would cost if I buy it on the exchange, and then maybe, you know, talk to my employer or try to convince my employer that it's cheaper for me to go buy it on the exchange and, and I'd rather you give me the cash. So. I'm reading between the lines of the intent, but, but they did said this is to help employees be better consumers. Originally, this reporting requirement was going to be in effect for this year, but thankfully they delayed that, and so now the reporting requirement will be effective for your 2012 W-2s, and that means those W-2s that you would issue in January of 2013. So the reason we're telling you about this now, though, is because you need or you should probably track this as you go along in 2012. So by January 1, 2012, your payroll processing systems and tracking mechanisms should be in place so that when you get around to issuing that W-2 for 2012, you've got all the information ready to go. So this new reporting requirement is going to apply to all employers, and that includes employers who are churches, state and local governments, basically every kind of employer that exists out in the United States, with the exception of employers that filed fewer than 250 W-2s in their prior year. Now, normally in the context of ERISA or benefit plans, every time we say employer, we normally mean employer as determined on a controlled group basis and you guys have probably heard this dozens of times. Well, with ERISA plans, every time we say employer, we really mean all companies that are connected through 80% or greater ownership. Those are treated as a single employer. Here, however, I don't think that's the rule, and I looked through the, the IRS guidance, um, and I couldn't find any place that they said controlled group rules apply here. So my reading of the rules at this point is that this rule truly applies on an employer-by-employer -employer basis as you would normally think about who's the employer. The only exception to that that I can see is if you've got a consolidated group of companies that are using a common paymaster. In that situation, even if one of the employers in that consolidated group would file fewer than 250 W-2s, because it's being done on this consolidated common paymaster basis, I think you aggregate the W-2s in that situation. So the reporting, again, is going to be on the W-2. It will be in box 12, and you're going to report the amount with the code DD. So the IRS, frankly, was very reasonable in the guidance they gave us, and we can be thankful for that. So one of the things they said is, if an employee terminates mid-year and they come to you and they say, can I get my W-2 now instead of in January, when you issue that W-2 to them, you actually don't have to report the value of their health coverage on their W-2 at all. So you get complete waiver for reporting for that kind of person. In addition, if somebody terminates um, mid-year and they're going to get their W-2 in January along with everybody else, it's up to you whether you're going to report the value of their health care coverage that they get after the date they terminate employment. So you could choose to just say, nope, when you terminate employment, whatever value of coverage I've provided you to that point, that's the only thing that's going on your W-2. Or let's say they elect COBRA or through the severance plan, they get some extended coverage. You can, if you want, report the value of that coverage as well but you do not have to. The other great rule that they gave us was that if you otherwise aren't going to issue a W-2 to a person, um, you don't have to issue a W-2 just for the sole purpose of reporting the value of this health coverage. So for example, you got a retiree medical plan, you're otherwise not issuing W-2s to your retirees, 
no new, no need to do a special W-2 just for this purpose. So in talking about what health care coverages do you have this reporting obligation for, it's frankly easier to talk about the things that you don't have to report because the list of exceptions is really long. Um, what you're going to see here ultimately is for most employers out in the world, you're probably going to come down to you have to report the value of your major medical plan coverage and probably nothing else. So some of the exceptions that they gave us are for you, don't, you do not have to report long-term care, disability insurance, things like workers' comp, a specified disease or illness policy like a cancer-only coverage, one of those types of supplemental policies, um, dental or vision if it's under a separate policy certificate or contract from the major medical plan. You also don't have to report Archer MSA contributions, health savings account contributions, employee contributions to your medical flexible spending account. If you have union employees and you're making contributions to like a multi-employer welfare benefit fund, don't have to report those. Um, health reimbursement arrangements, no reporting. Dental or vision plans that are standalone plans, meaning your dental or vision plan is not otherwise integrated with your medical plan. Don't have to report those. So, as I said, when you look at all the stuff you don't have to report, where I'm coming down to is your major medical plan and prescription drug, and then if you make employer contributions to a medical flexible spending account, those would have to be reported. And I wanted to highlight on this slide that while the, the list on the prior slide was a list that was excluded by law, this list on this slide was simply the IRS um, being generous to us saying you don't have to report these things. So this is just a rule that they've adopted, but that means that in the future the rule might change and they may change their mind and say, no, nope, we actually want you to start reporting these things from now on. So in determining the amount to report, you calculate both the employer and the employee portions. So um, you look at both, both sides of the contributions, but for, again, for your medical flexible spending account, only the employer contributions to the medical flexible spending account. And the amount you report, um, can vary depending on how you've designed your plan. You are allowed to report the value based on how you calculate your COBRA premiums. I'm going to guess 98% of employers in the world are going to pick this method. So if your COBRA premium is 1000 a month, um, then you're going to report 1000 a month as the value of the health care coverage you're providing to an active employee. If you have a fully insured plan, you, of course, are allowed to use the insurance company premium rates that are being charged. And if you have a composite rate plan, you can report based on that composite rate. And a composite rate plan would be a kind of plan, for example, where um, whether you're an employee or employee plus spouse or employee with eight children, I just have one rate for everybody and it's a, sort of like a blended rate, and so I can report the value of the coverage on that blended rate basis. Now, if somebody changes coverage during the year, you are required to track that and report that appropriately. So let's say, for example, I had single coverage for the first half of the year at $500 a month, and I get married midway through the year, and so I switch to family coverage. And so for the second half of the year, I have family coverage at $1,000 a month. So what my employer is supposed to report to me is uh, six months at my 500 rate and six months at my $1,000 rate for a total of 9000 on my W-2. If you have the type of plan where somebody can change their elections mid-period, so let's say somebody could come in on April 10th and change from single to family coverage. 
the, re uh, the, the rules give you some leeway about how you do that. So they say you could pick the rate that was in effect at the beginning of the month. So if I was employee-only coverage at the beginning of the month, then for that whole month, use that number for me, even though I switched it mid-month. You could pick the rate that would be in effect at the end of the month, or if you wanted to actually do some kind of proration, you know, 10 days at the single rate, 20 days at the family rate, go ahead and do that as well. But you can pick anything you want that's reasonable, and that will be fine. So the guidance that I just walked through with you is interim guidance only. Um, but the IRS has said, look, if we change the rules on you, we aren't going to make them effective until the January 1. That's at least six months after we change the rules. So they've thankfully signaled to us that if they do change uh, their mind about these reporting requirements, they will give people plenty of leeway to, again, redo their payroll systems and prepare for it. And in this interim guidance, they also promised us that whatever changes they might make will not be effective for 2012. So the rules I just went through, you can be assured, are the rules for 2012. So the earliest changes that might be made would be 2013. So that's great news, too. So what should you be doing now to get ready for this? We'll go through all your plans that you have and figure out which ones have to be reported and which don't. And again, a lot of plans aren't going to have to be reported. Go through some of the decision points. Um, if I allow somebody to enroll mid-month, which am I going to use the beginning of the month rate, the end of the month rate? Am I going to do a proration? What am I going to do with people who terminate employment? Am I going to report the value of their coverage after their termination of employment or not? So go through and make some of those decisions. And then work with your outside payroll vendor, or if you do payroll internally, your payroll department, to figure out how you're going to start tracking this and getting it into the payroll system so that when you do that W-2 at the end of 2012, everything will be in the system and ready to go. And then one final point on this, I just want to be very clear that nothing in these rules change the taxation of health benefits. So if you are providing medical coverage that's taxable, like to a domestic partner or maybe under certain state law um, where certain, you know, children aren't considered tax dependents and you have to uh, value their coverage and write it on the W-2 for state tax purposes, all of those rules will continue in effect unless they're changed. Um, and so you would report stuff in box one on the W-2 like you're normally doing this is just this extra informational reporting requirement for 2012. With that, I will turn it back to Kathy. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, please use your Q&A pull-down menu and just type in your question. We'll do our best to answer your questions. But we do have a few questions that have been submitted. Uh, Lee, actually, it's a question for you. If uh, an employer uses the premium, uh, the COBRA premium method for reporting the value of health care. Would that include the 2% administration fee? No. So my reading of the rules is that you would do the, the COBRA premium without regard to that 2% fee, so just a 100% amount. Okay, good. Uh, there's a question for Isaac. Um, what, could, what steps should an employer take to be sure that or to avoid class action claims against their 401k plan about excessive fees? Uh, yeah, you know, I thought this question might be asked, and unfortunately, you cannot, you cannot, uh, I cannot give you any guarantee or any, any steps that you can take that will prevent uh, a claim being filed against you for excessive fees. On the positive side, however, um, you can take uh, steps that will, that will not only discourage such claims from being filed, but will also put yourself in the best possible uh, position to defend uh, claims against excessive fees if, if someone does file such a claim. And those steps really include what I like to refer to as, as doing your homework. Hopefully these steps sound familiar, but, you know, doing the necessary investigation, uh, the discussions, uh, and any third-party consultation or, or um, uh, intercompany consultation, doing the necessary reviews, and, and and other similar prudent person uh, actions. Um, 
those those steps aren't going to provide you again with with absolutes, but they will put you in the best uh, the best possible position that you can be in. I know oftentimes it seems like when I read ERISA cases that as long as the employer has gone through doing their homework and documenting, you know, what their decisions, if the court is not going to hold them to the correct answer, but just that they had made a thoughtful process in reaching their decisions. And I agree. It, it really comes down to uh, why you did uh, being just as important or more important than than uh, what what you actually did do. Let's see. I have another question for Lee, and it's a question of how do you uh, determine the amount reported if you're a self-funded plan? So if you're a self-funded plan, I think you're going to have to pick that COBRA uh, rate. So every self-funded plan under COBRA rules has to um, determine on an actuarial basis what the value of the coverage is so you know the premiums to be charging for COBRA purposes. So um, you're going to have to do something like that. Now, interestingly, Kathy, one of the exclusions that I didn't highlight is that if you're a self-funded plan that's not subject to COBRA, um, so, for example, let's say you're a church employer who isn't subject to COBRA and you have a self-funded plan, you're actually exempted from this reporting requirement, um, and maybe they did that because you're not calculating COBRA premiums because you're not subject to COBRA. So it, it did look to me like they gave some thought about that. Um, but, again, for self-funded plans, the COBRA premiums, to me, is going to be the way to go. Lee, I agree with that, but I think at least two IRS commentators have, in public announcements have said you don't have to use that, and particularly if that's not a real estimation of value. Now, why it isn't when you're actually going to an actual calculation, but um, but the, the, the IRS has uh, you know, publicly stated you don't have to use it, and there may be a better number Good without point. explaining what that could be. <laughs> right, right. Right. Uh, just a quick question as a follow-up for Mike. Uh, um, one of our viewers asked, what exactly is the specific site for the most recent notice regarding the internal and external claims handling and the postponement of the enforcement? That's uh, The actual site is technical release 2011-01, and you can find it on the Department of Labor's website. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, this is an interesting question, and I'm sure a lot of us have been thinking about it. Reading the tea leaves, asked Ron, what is the general consensus, consensus of whether or not PPAC is going to survive the Supreme Court? Does anybody want to venture a guess? <laughs> this is Mike. I, I'll venture a guess, and people can shoot it down. I, I think a lot of people believe that there's a reasonable chance that it, that it will be um, overturned based on the individual mandate. Um, based based on the relatively conservative outlook of the court. Um, but I've read a couple very interesting uh, justice-by-justice analysis um, that concluded that it's probably going to be 5-4 in, uh, upholding the law, uh, that some of the conservative justices are going to be hard to... To, to win over under the you can't treat this as a tax or um, that the individual mandate is not something that falls under the Commerce Clause. Well, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your questions. If you happen to think of other questions, here are our contact information, and please either give us a call or um, uh, just send us an email. Also, too, just wanted to remind you, if you wanted to mark your calendars, our next broadcast is going to be on July 26th, and then the last broadcast will be on October 25th. And um, just wanted to thank you very much for spending an hour with us today. Uh, if you would like to have a copy of the PowerPoint or to listen to this presentation again, it both will be available on our website in the next day or so. And we also welcome your feedback. If you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to, feed, uh, to complete the survey, we'd really appreciate it. We really do value your input. But with that, thank you very much, and have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's event. Thank you for your participation, and have a wonderful day. You may all disconnect. Mm -hmm.